I'm Alice, I'm a postdoc at Leiden Observatory in the group of Davina Vandeshuk. And today I'm going to talk about chemical complexity in Herbig disks with some observations that are kind of uniquely facilitated by ALMOTH. So when we think about complex organic molecules, we know that they can form efficiently in the dark, cold, um, shielded conditions in molecular clouds. And as this material gets incorporated into forming stars and disks, and then subsequently things like planets and comets, we want to trace the kind of delivery and the evolution of this complex organic material, since we know comets are rich in comms. So one of the interesting questions is whether or not the comms that we see in these class two disks, so about a million to 10 million years old, are inherited by the disk from an earlier stage, or whether or not they're actually forming in the disk itself. So this history doesn't really matter in that case. So we think of class two disks, our archetypes that we kind of always go to are TW Hydra and HD163296. So these are a T Tori and a Herbig AE disk. Um, and these kind of disks, the differences in them is probably primarily just due to the differences in the central stars. So we have a lower luminosity star and a much higher luminosity star. And that means that these disks are generally, we call them cold. So we can get temperatures less than um, 20 Kelvin and we call these disks warm where most of the material is above that. And they both have nice ring structures that we've we seen just then because of ALMO. When we go to the Herbig disks, the ones that I'm gonna focus on mostly today, we have a second distinction that we make, which is based on observations of SEDs and in the scattered light, where we go to group one and two. In the group one disk, you can see that you have this flared structure. It's like a bowl coming at you from the near side of the disk. Whereas the group two disks, they're more flatter. So we don't really see a good scattered light response in the outer disk. We just see the inner kind of rim. So the idea has been that these more flared disks that are intercepting more UV radiation that are going to be warmer will be less and molecular rich than these group one disks, these group two disks, I mean, which are a lot more shielded and flatter. So when we're thinking about complex organic molecules, one thing we want to think about is if they have these disks have CO ice or not. So this is a chemical model showing with radius and height, the abundance of CO ice in a T-Tori and a Herbig disk model. So CO will freeze out at about 20 Kelvin, and we call this um, area in the disk the snow surface where this happens. In a T-Tori disk, we have a lot of CO ice, basically 10 to the minus 4, which with respect to H2, which is about the total abundance of CO we expect in a disk. And then when we go to a Herbig disk, we see that we don't see very significant freeze out of CO at all. So if we have less CO ice, then we might assume that we're going to have less methanol in these disks because methanol primarily forms from hydrogenation of CO ice. So CO plus H through to formaldehyde and eventually methanol. So when we look at class two disks, we've detected methanol robustly in just one um, TW hydra. TW hydra is a cold disk and we see that the methanol is associated with where we have the freeze out of CO, which makes sense. When we go to a warmer disk, 162296, the non-detection has been explained by having a warmer disk, so we have less freeze out of CO, less methanol formation, and also a higher UV flux. So any methanol in the gas phase is a lot more easily destroyed. And one way that we like to compare different sources and look at them is by taking ratios of methanol to formaldehyde. And that's because these species can be chemically linked. Um, so when we look at this TW hydra, the ratio is about 1.3. And when we go to this warmer disk, it drops and this methanol's non-detection means that this is an upper limit on this ratio. So they're distinctly quite different. So what we're interested in is where the methanol in these class two disks is. This is a kind of simple cartoon showing a methanol snow line at about 100 Kelvin and a CO snow line at 20 Kelvin. These distances depend on the type of star that you have. So something like TW Hydra will be the smaller numbers and a warmer disk will have the larger numbers. Um, in TW Hydra, what we see is methanol on the outer disk that's coming off the grains at very low temperatures. So we call this non-thermal desorption, and this is beyond the CO snow line, and we're not seeing a lot of methanol. We'd also expect to see some sort of thermal reservoir methanol in the inner disk, similar to what we see in outbursting sources. But we might not see this in a disk like 162296 because the dust is optically thick at millimeter wavelengths, and that would hide this molecular emission. So do all disks have a reservoir of methanol in them and we just don't detect it because of some um, observational issues? Or do we only have methanol in these cold disks where we're able to form it on the CO ice reservoir? 
So the disk I'm going to focus on is 100546. It's a very well studied Trevig star. It's about 100 parsecs away. It was targeted actually in Alma Cycle Zero, which got these nice observations of the 12 CO gas disk, which is about 400 AU in radius, and the millimeter dust disk, which is about 200, 250 AU. More recent observations with Alma have shown that the inner disk here is quite a nice and um, neat ring with a central cavity, which is kind of to scale. It's a lot smaller, kind of pops in the middle here. And something that's interesting about this disk is that there's a few directly and indirectly detected planets here. So one of them is at about 50 AU um, outside this ring, and one of them is um, within the ring itself and on the inside. So to put that into another tiny cartoon, um, we have a gas cavity at about um, 10, 13 AU, um, a dust ring centered at about 25 AU, a gap, and then another ring in the actual disk. So I was lucky enough to get some Alma Cycle 7 observations um, before Alma shut down. And this was a band 7 project. And the main goal was to target some sulfur lines, but we also targeted some methanol and formaldehyde lines with the remaining um, spectral settings. So there's weren't necessarily the optimal lines to target, but they were um, the ones that kind of fitted in our setting. And they have quite high um, upper energy levels. Um, so that was what these observations were. And we detected formaldehyde, which wasn't too unexpected because formaldehyde has been detected in about maybe 20 different disks. So it is commonly thought of now as a tracer of disks. And what we see is two components of emission. We've got a ring in the outer disk and a more compact central component um, unresolved on source. So going back to the cartoon, we're probably seeing emission linked to this outer dust ring and then this um, potentially this inner um, reservoir um, as well. What was slightly more unexpected was that we actually detected methanol as well. Um, we mostly have this compact component on source, um, which is about maybe 50 AU um, across. And we also have some potentially some weaker extended emission in the outer disk, reminiscent of what is seen in the formaldehyde, but the signal to noise isn't that great. So when we go to have a look at how much methanol we actually have and formaldehyde compared to the kind of other two disks I've been talking about. We find we have slightly more formaldehyde than um, in TW Hydro, and about double that in 162296. But when we look at the methanol numbers, even accounting for having two times the amount of formaldehyde, we'd still have, um, I guess, seven times more um, methanol than was not detected in 162296. So this is quite distinctly different. When we go back to the kind of plot with the ratios that um, we like to use, we find that it's Basically, 100546 is kind of consistent within TW Hydra's um, range, maybe slightly more, but then it is distinctly larger than um, what we see in the other Herbig disk. And these disks are not very different. They have a very similar um, dust and disk mass. They're around similar spectral type stars. So it's something else is happening between the two um, disks to have such a difference. And it might just be because um, the disk that we found with the methanol has a large central cavity, whereas this um, other disk does not. So when we kind of look into this radially, we see that in the inner disk, we have a lot more, we have a much higher ratio than in the outer disk. So in the outer disk, it's closer to what is in TW Hydra, but in the inner disk, we reach a ratio of around 10 to 15. And this is more reminiscent of what you see in young stellar objects or massive young stellar objects in hot cores, hot carinos. So this is quite interesting that we see this um, kind of for that unresolved kind of inner part of the disk. So, we want to think a little bit about what chemical models predict for the abundances of methanol in these types of disks in order to see if what we're observing um, makes sense um, in the context of the system that we know that we have. So this is a generic chemical model of a Herbig disk. And um, just to highlight that in the inner disk, we do expect to have some sort of thermally desorbed reservoir of methanol. And that could explain the kind of bright um, region we have in the middle where we have a lot of methanol. So what we did is we took a specific disk model. So we took a structure a physical structure of the disk that has been constrained from other observations and connected it up to the same kind of chemistry to have a look to see what we could predict for our disk. So this shows the calm density of methanol against the radius in the disk. It's a log plot up to 25 AU, then a well, linear plot to 25 AU, then it splits out to a log plot. So the dashed lines are the ice and the salt lines are the gas. And then we have a few different time steps. 
So in this model, we start in the disk with methanol ice. So the disk has methanol ice when the model begins. And what we find is we're not making any extra ice in the outer disk. And in the inner disk, it's rapidly um, depleting. And if we run this same model um, without any um, methanol inherited, we find that we don't actually, we aren't actually able to make enough methanol for it to be observable. So next slide. One interpretation is that we're looking at the sublimation of ices um, at the inner cavity of this disk. So this is the dust temperature derived from some observations of crystalline silicates. Um, so at about 13 AU, which is where we see this peak in our model is where we have um, the methanol. And a sublimation temperature of methanol about 100, 150 Kelvin in this area um, makes sense with what we see. So we can kind of understand the emission structure that we see. And it's been proposed that transition disks might have a unit chemistry like this because they have this inner cavity wall that's exposed um, to the central star. But this is the first time we've seen something like this um, traced in comms. And it might be the case because the methanol we see continually depletes in the model that we might have to enhance the inner disk with some material from the outer disk, but that's still um, up to interpretation, I think. So to summarize, um, we've got methanol in a class two warm perfect disk for the first time. Unexpectedly in the disk that we thought would be more molecule poor is actually more molecule rich. And that might be down to the different structures where we have a central cavity in one and not in the other. Because we can't make any methanol in the disk because it's very warm, we have to start with methanol, meaning the disk needs to inherit methanol from an earlier phase, meaning some of the kind of interstellar pristine material is surviving the formation of the disk. And transition, transition disks might be very useful in looking for comms um, in class two disks where we haven't really been able to detect many so far. And it shows that these warm disks, even though they are warm, they do have a lot of organic matter that can be incorporated into forming and planets and systems and things like that. So that's everything. Thank you for listening.